One of the enduring lessons from all our case studies is that police as an institution and policing as a function are critical for countering illicit power, yet time and again we get policing development completely wrong. So I think we need to do some serious examination about why this is so hard and how can we fix our approach. I'd like to start at the beginning by thinking about the psychology of policing, first from a cop's perspective. Here's Mark Croker. I begin just my short remarks by inviting you to come with me uh, to my childhood. I'm, I'm age six. I'm with my father. And my father is a missionary in uh, the Belgian Congo. We are, uh, I'm accompanying him on a trip to Kikwit. And we uh, are walking past a police station. It's a, it's a white police station. There are police officers about. And I see something on the side of this police station uh, hanging there, uh, thread-like. And I ask my father, what are those? My father looked grim. He paused for a minute and he said, those are elephant whips. And I said, what are they for? And he said, uh, Belgians teach the police here how to use those to control the population of the city of Kikwit. Well, right there, there was a moment that changed my life uh, because I knew that was wrong. And my father knew it was wrong, but there it was. There was something drastically wrong. And I guess as the years passed and I found myself Later, in 1965, showing up at my first police station in Los Angeles, that wrongness um, remained with me. When I have an encounter with a police officer, I am in one of two situations. Either I'm a potential suspect or witness, so I feel at risk of being detained, or I've had something bad happen to me and I need help, in which case I'm vulnerable. So fundamentally, the relationship between the police and the policed in any encounter is inherently unequal. If we look at policing from this perspective, it should be obvious that for a police officer to do his or her job, they have to have some kind of personal relationship with the people and the community. And this relationship is completely different from the kind that military security forces have. It is interactive on a very personal level police must interact because, especially in the context of countering illicit networks and bad actors, their job is to prevent crime, discover crime, investigate crime, and support successful prosecution. Police can't do any of these things if the people in the community won't talk to them or don't trust them. Policing by checkpoint, which is what I've seen in almost every conflict setting, or standoff policing through technology, does not enable proactive relationship building. There's no real opportunity for interaction because it's too fraught with risk. I used to hear it all the time in Afghanistan. The Afghans would tell me, nothing good happens near a checkpoint. And you know what? They were right. So immediately, even the simplest capacity building for policing to counter illicit power is more about community engagement than it is about train and equip. But the metrics that we routinely use to measure success in institutional development are all about quantity, infrastructure, and equipment. And the philosophy we apply in high-risk settings is that community policing is a luxury we can't afford until security is restored. There is a continuum, however, and this is where the security force mix comes into play. I like the way David Beer described it for us. The question of interoperability of the police and military functions is not easily explained. But I think it can be more easily understood if looked at through a security lens. Consider a, a security scale with war at one end and peace at the other. These terms don't need to be defined so much as understood in context. Security in the context of war is the domain of the soldier. In the context of peace, the domain of the police. The roles and skills of soldier and police converge along that scale. More soldier in the context of war, more police in the context of peace. In the context of a violent environment countering illicit power, more soldier may be required to apprehend and get control. In the context of rules of engagement, more police required to prosecute and keep control through prosecution in the context of rule of law. So, 
soldiering rules of engagement, policing rule of law. I think that's a good way to think of it. Absolutely. I appreciate the fact that David highlighted the relationship between the military and the police as collaboration among equals. Unfortunately, in my experience with military operations, to include peacekeeping, this is seldom the case. The overwhelming dominance of the military in planning and execution of security force assistance and the pace of military operations combine to model behavior that, while it fits the dynamics of combat, is detrimental to the institutional development of the police. When international police have executive authority, their role is to conduct policing operations within the rule of law. This restores not only law and order, but also public trust and confidence in the role of the police. All of these functions set up a situation where over the course, illicit power and corruption can be routed out. The importance of having a long-term vision for policing development can't be overstated, but defining that strategic framework is easier said than done. In 2010, the NATO training mission Afghanistan assumed the lead for development of the Afghan National Police from civilian agencies who had really struggled to establish a credible, sustainable force. NTMA, rightly, shifted both resources and priority to the Ministry of Interior, but needed a strategy. Canadian General Stu Beer came up with what we called the Three Horizons. The Three Horizons strategy for the Afghan National Police was about balancing the immediate security imperatives of countering insurgency with the enduring requirement for a responsive, accountable, and capable security institution that could support and sustain the rule of law. It acknowledged the fact that we were simultaneously building an institution, a ministry, an operating force, a culture, and all of the subsystems needed to support it. I've used this framework ever since because it accurately describes the type of planning we have to do for institutional development within the security sector to succeed in high threat or high risk environments. It helps us stay focused on a strategic steady state when everything around us is pulling our attention to near term gains and quick wins. In the Horizon 3 strategy, Horizon 1 is the here and now. It addresses the need to rapidly recruit, train, and assign baseline security forces that can hold territory, protect the population, and create space for legitimate governance to be restored. This is the front end of the continuum that David Beer spoke of, and it is primarily a military task. Horizon 2 focuses on the transformation from baseline presence to more robust institutional capacity. In an international mission, development shifts from externally led training and equipping to host nation led development of its own security system. Security sector governance, and specifically Ministry of Interior Development and Professionalization, assumes increasing importance. Our case studies reflect that if institutional development within the rule of law is not the priority, then anything gained through train and equip is quickly lost as soon as the international community lets go of the reins. You have to work on the police because this is the picture of the government and the government should have a good picture and that will be the police. Horizon 3 represents the host nation's strategic vision for itself. It is not an end state but rather a steady state where the police, under competent ministerial direction and control, is a self-generating and sustaining institution nested within the security and justice system. The institutional focus is on providing public safety and security and enforcing and strengthening the rule of law. Within Horizon 3, the institutions continue to evolve and develop to meet the host nation's changing security needs. It's never a static end state. In a mature security system such as our own, we are always in Horizon 3. Horizon 3 also acknowledges that other functional pillars within the criminal justice system may lag behind in development, leaving critical law enforcement and public service gaps. Horizon 3 anticipates such gaps and focuses on those capabilities required within the police to preempt or compensate for them. 
Policing competencies such as dispute resolution, community engagement, and interaction with informal or alternative justice systems already in place, as well as civic support, take on increasing importance. From a development standpoint, Horizon 3 represents generational change. Recent research indicates that in the case of new institution building, we're talking about 25 to 30 years to get to Horizon 3. The timeline may sound like a non-starter, but remember that this is the vision that guides the actions that are taken in Horizons 1 and 2, not the so-called end state. Experience tells us that if Horizon 1 and Horizon 2 do not lead to Horizon 3, and especially if they take you off track, even temporarily, then you've just increased the risk of strategic failure for the police because you've derailed the cultural shift toward policing within the rule of law that you're trying to achieve. I said that establishing a strategic framework is easier said than done. Indeed, in Afghanistan, while no one disagreed with the theory behind Three Horizons, the military, the international police missions, and embassy civilian personnel all struggled to visualize it. Why? First, because they didn't really understand what policing traditionally looked like in the Afghan context, so they kept trying to push a vision of Horizon 3 that mirrored what we knew rather than what fit within the Afghan legal and governance framework. I saw the same problem with the UN mission in Liberia, with port policing in Yemen, and the Serious Crimes Investigative Unit in Albania. To be accurate and sustainable, Horizon 3 has to reflect the host nation's vision for itself. And we can't write that for them. The second problem in Afghanistan was the constant tension between the tactics being employed by the battle space owners and the development strategy being employed in the Ministry of Interior. At times, the two were diametrically opposed. This in turn created confusion on all sides and at all levels. The next challenge that arises is what exactly are the police prepared to do and does the rule of law system enable them to do it? A problem for police is that unlike the military, they don't control the end game. For a military unit conducting operations against a network, for example, success can be defined as killing or capturing the key leaders or destroying the network by kinetic means. But for police, their measure of success is prevention, nothing bad happened, or successful prosecution within the legal framework. To succeed at either one requires an entirely different set of personal attributes and skills. The rest of the rule of law system has to work if they're going to be successful, and the police have to work as a component of that larger system. They can't be isolated from it or independent of it. For this reason, whenever I'm working on rule of law development, the first thing I do is map out all of the other players in the justice and security sector on whom the police must rely. I put the police in the center of that system, and then I have my host nation partners describe for me how they work with every other organization or function. If they can't tell me, and then demonstrate what they've described about how they work, with the courts, magistrates, community leaders, prisons, social services, if there are any, prosecutors and defense attorneys, military and paramilitary, intelligence organizations, etc., then I know we have a capacity gap. These coordinating relationships are mission essential tasks for police before they even get down to the business of technical law enforcement. Because if they don't have these coordinating relationships, then the rule of law system won't work, which again means there is no end game. Thinking back to Afghanistan for a moment, one of the initiatives that we tried to get underway was to establish a weekly senior justice shura that would bring together the ministers of interior, defense, justice, the attorney general, chief justice of the Supreme Court, and head of the national directorate of security. The objective we were trying to achieve was the transition from military-led security operations under the law of armed conflict to police-led evidence-based operations under Afghan domestic law. At the time, ISAF was already facilitating a weekly senior security shura that brought the security line ministries together to coordinate operations. If our objective was to move the Afghans to evidence-based operations, 
then shouldn't we be facilitating a similar model for criminal justice? When I returned a year later in 2012, the Minister of Interior on his own had initiated the process. Why? Because he saw it as necessary for fulfillment of the Afghan vision for the National Police. It represented his Horizon 3. And when I returned in 2014, the Afghans were still doing it as part of their internal planning for their upcoming presidential elections. The internationals were not invited. That entire experience reminded me in many ways of our own coordination during the run-up to the invasion of Panama in 1989. Operation Just Cause was, at its core, a military operation with a law enforcement objective, the arrest and conviction of then Panamanian dictator and indicted drug trafficker Manuel Noriega. As Southcom planners, this meant we had to adapt our thinking and our priorities. Toward that end, we literally flew our U.S. attorney and law enforcement counterparts down to Panama City, ensconced them on base in our BOQs, and embedded them into our planning process 24-7, up to and including the morning of the invasion. The successful prosecution of Noriega in a Miami federal court two years later is evidence of the success of that collaboration. I've worked with many of those same federal law enforcement agents since. They lament the fact that they don't believe they've ever seen the same level of high and early military law enforcement cooperation on any of their subsequent missions, and they wonder why. So perhaps it's not surprising that we give short shrift to cross-justice sector coordination as an essential capacity building task when we haven't completely institutionalized it for ourselves. Finally, we can't talk about the problem of police without addressing the problem of corruption and incompetence. I asked Mark Croker if, looking back, his views on institutional development had changed. And here's what he had to say. In many ways, my views have shifted substantially across the years. As I entered the international development domain more than 20 years ago, I had the impression, based on a set of assumptions, that you could plan, fund, execute plans that provided results. I thought, accordingly, that you could predict outcomes and count on a certain return on the investment of your money and sweat. Now I fear we have to assume cynical backstories, self-interest of players, murky financial dealings, secondary agendas, and outright duplicity among the players. So it follows, we need to be quite guarded on predicting results. It's sad for optimists like most of us are to confront the fact that we'll likely be manipulated, deceived, neutered, or sidetracked in our efforts, and that sincere, well-meaning counterparts are very, very hard to find. In my own work in 13 different countries, I'm hard-pressed to find examples of successful policing development, because every time I think I've seen transformation, something happens and things begin to fall apart. But there are three principles that always apply that you find in every mature, functioning, and accountable law enforcement institution. Number one is you have to inoculate the system. Every single function, even the most mundane, has to contain a check on accountability and a means of oversight. Number two, there must be effective practical processes for discipline and enforcement ranging from the lowest level administrative actions to high level prosecution, and they have to be put in place from day one. And number three, finally, the system has to work constantly and seamlessly to establish and reward a culture of accountability and public service. I might add that when police are fully integrated within the totality of the justice system as a whole, that integration is, in and of itself, part of achieving these three principles. Ultimately, if I had to sum up the problem of police, I would say this, integrity can't be overrated and vigilance can't be relaxed.